We're now going to look at the general properties of mechanisms. Now, mechanism is something that you may have discussed briefly in general chemistry, but it's a central concept in our understanding of organic chemistry reactions. We are going to be re analyzing the vast majority of organic chemistry reactions, trying to understand the mechanism, how it works, and thereby understand the special properties of each reaction. So what is a mechanism? Well, technically, a mechanism is the set of physical changes and atomic movements on a molecular level that occur as the reaction goes from reactants to products. In other words, when we have a chemical reaction, we have a substance with a certain number of atoms and bonds arranged in a certain way. That substance changes into the product. What we want to understand is how did the atoms move? How did the bonds break and become formed in order to transform the reactant substance into the product substance? Now, most mechanisms are actually very complicated. And in fact, mechanisms themselves for a given reaction often have many little reactions as a part of them. And we call those little uh, reactions that add up or uh, make the entire mechanism, we call those elementary reactions. So an elementary reaction is an individual reaction. It occurs as part of a mechanism. We also sometimes use the term mechanistic step. It's considered a step in the overall process. This diagram sort of represents how we think of a mechanism. So the first term I want to introduce here is the observed reaction. The observed reaction is the overall reaction that we observe in the test tube in the laboratory. We take this substance, we put in some type of reactants, and then at the end, the substance is changed to a different substance. So for example, if I had a substance which I could just represent symbolically as A, it would change into substance D as a result of this observed reaction. The elementary reactions then are all of the little individual changes that occur on the pathway from A all the way to D. So for example, A might convert first to B, then it might B might do a reaction and become C, and then C might do a reaction and become D. So each of these is an elementary reaction. One characteristic of the elementary reactions is that if we stack them up and add them up, canceling things that appear on both sides, they add up to our overall observed reaction. The other thing about elementary reactions is that they have either products and or reactants that do not appear in the observed reaction. So we call these uh, molecules that appear in the elementary reactions, but not the observed reaction, we call these intermediates. Intermediates are usually unstable. Most of the time we can't even isolate them to study them. So we know about them because of uh, indirect information. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, how we get information about what the intermediates are in a reaction. Because we want to describe how atoms are moving and bonds are breaking and forming during a reaction mechanism, we're going to need a tool to sort of represent that so that we can communicate that. What we're going to use as our tool is arrow pushing or curved arrow formalism that we discussed in an earlier chapter. So in an earlier chapter, we talked about drawing curved arrows to show how electrons and atoms move during a reaction. And there was a basic rule. Curved arrows always start on electrons and they point to either atoms or bonds, uh, showing where the electrons that we start on move to. There's four basic patterns of curved arrows that we see in 
uh, elementary reactions. We're going to go through these and um, I just want you to kind of get a sense of what they represent. We're going to actually learn the specific ones for each reaction as we discuss it. So um, this is just sort of an overview. Okay, so the first type of uh, arrow pushing, curved arrow change that we see um, is what we call a nucleophile attack. In a nucleophile, um, the arrow starts on a pair of electrons or on a pi bond, and it points toward an atom that has a full or partial positive charge. So we have the electrons being attracted to a positive charge in the substance. So it can be a full positive formal charge because, for example, on a carbon like this, there's an incomplete octet, and carbons with incomplete octets have a positive formal charge. Or it can be a partial formative char formal charge from a polar covalent bond. So our arrow shows the electrons making a bond to that atom. That's a nucleophile attack. We can also have the exact reverse of that, a bond breaking, which sometimes we're going to call the loss of a leaving group. In a bond breaking reaction, we have a covalent bond. It breaks away from one of the two atoms in the bond and moves completely onto the partner atom. So when this happens, a portion of this overall molecule becomes detached from the molecule right here. We call that piece a leaving group. The arrow starts on the bond because that's the pair of electrons that's moving and it points to one of the atoms in the leaving group because that's where the pair of electrons arrives. And when it arrives, it becomes a lone pair because it's no longer between two atoms, but it's only attached on one atom. The next pattern we see is proton transfer. To show a proton transfer, we're going to use two curved arrows at the same time. The curved arrows are going to start on electrons in the base. Now, in the base, those electrons could either be a lone pair or they could be a pi bond. I've shown an example with a lone pair. So the electrons are going to move through space and try to make a bond to a positively charged hydrogen. The hydrogen would have a positive charge because it might be part of a polar covalent bond, for example. So this pair of electrons is going to try to make a bond to that hydrogen. Now hydrogens typically only have one covalent bond to them. So in order to make a bond from the nitrogen to the hydrogen, we're going to have to let go of the uh, bond that the hydrogen already has. So to show that, that's a bond breaking. So we have a bond forming or a nucleophile attack here, and then a bond breaking here where this pair of electrons moves on to the oxygen atom. The net effect then is that this molecule now has a bond to a hydrogen and therefore it has become the conjugate acid. So this is just a representation of a Bronsted-Lowry acid-base reaction. Finally, the last type of electron movement that we see in reaction mechanisms is what's called a rearrangement. In a rearrangement, some atom or group of atoms plus a bond move from one location to another. Generally, this movement will occur because the group of atoms that moves is attached to a carbon that has a carbon with an incomplete octet or an atom with an incomplete octet adjacent to it. To represent this, technically all we need to do is show the covalent bond that's moving. We start on that pair of electrons and show that pair of electrons moving toward the atom where the bond will arrive. I often 
put a little box around the entire group that's moving because when this bond moves, this hydrogen atom, for example, moves with it. And so now this group, instead of being attached to our central carbon here, is now attached over here. And the incomplete octet, octet is now in the central carbon. Now these are called specific types of shifts or rearrangements, depending on what moved. The most common thing that moves is a hydrogen. And when the hydrogen moves, what we see is a hydrogen plus two electrons are moving. If we write the structure of that piece, we would see that a hydrogen with a lone pair of electrons has a negative charge. A hydrogen with a negative charge is given the IDE ending. It's called hydride. And so this type of rearrangement is often called a 1-2 hydride shift. 1-2 indicating that it starts on one carbon, that would be the first carbon, and then moves to an adjacent carbon, that would be the second carbon. This is a relative numbering system that we're going to talk about more later. We also have 1-2 alkyl shifts where instead of having a hydrogen, we might have a methyl move or even a larger alkyl group. Although, typically as we're gonna see later, usually the smallest group prefers to move. 